Hello, hello everyone and good morning. My name is Mayar Osama. I'm a teaching assistant and researcher at the German University in Cairo. Today we're here to discuss uh, our work uh, titled Can Incremental Learning Help with Knowledge Graph Completion? We have mainly two problem statements uh, concerning knowledge graph and uh, question answering system. So the outline for uh, today, um, we're going to start by the introduction and the motivation behind our work. And then we're going to move on to uh, the related work work and uh, the background and then we're going to discuss the methodology that we use to prove our approach and then we're gonna um, exp um, explain our experiments and uh, the evaluation methods that we used and the results shown from these uh, experiments and then we're gonna have uh, a discussion about the conclusion future work and if you have any questions after that i will gladly answer them uh, so let's get started First of all, we're going to start by discussing the general architecture of any dialogue um, system architecture. Um, we start by having uh, the user sending their text into natural language. And the first thing that we need is that to have a natural language understanding module that extracts information from this user's text and then passes this information to a dialogue manager that is responsible for retrieving the answer or the correct response for the user. And then we have uh, this information passed to a natural language generation module that generates the response to the user in natural language text. How the knowledge is, is represented in uh, the knowledge base affects the techniques and the approaches used for the dialogue manager and the type of information that we need to extract from the user's text. The four main uh, or the four most common uh, ways to represent knowledge in question answering systems are dialogues where the Knowledge is represented as a set of conversation between a user and system or two users or question answers pairs. And the second most common one is to have documents where the knowledge is represented as a set of paragraphs. The third one, which is mostly used in task oriented dialogue system rather than question answering is intent and slot uh, values where um, the intents uh, classify the objective of this question and the slots that we need to fill it in order to answer this question. So for example, uh, utterance like wake me up at 5 a.m. Friday this week, the intent of this is to set an alarm and the slots that we need to fill is the time and the date. And finally, the main focus of our work today is knowledge crafts. Knowledge graph is a formal representation uh, for knowledge where the knowledge is represented as facts. Facts uh, consist of uh, two nodes and an edge between them where the dog is connected to the node animals through the relation is. We are going to uh, further discuss knowledge graph in the background. One of the main issues in all uh, knowledge representations is that knowledge incompleteness. Knowledge is incompleteness is one of the um, crucial uh, problems whenever we're dealing with uh, open domain question answering systems in general. And since uh, dialogues and documents are the most common ones, we it's easier to find more knowledge and it's easier to find available data sets collected for them. While intent and slot values and knowledge graphs are more um, format specific, so they require an expert to uh, collect them, which is why we don't have enough uh, data sets available for them. Um, our motivation, uh, this motivated our first uh, problem statement, which is to construct the knowledge graph from a question answering data set, and this opens up um, more area for research. The second problem for incompleteness is that it's almost impossible to collect all the information needed for an open domain question answering system, since um, this will be very uh, expensive and time consuming, and also uh, we might not have all the information needed at this. Uh, point. Um, one of the things that uh, motivated solving this problem is reasoning over the knowledge base. Reasoning over the knowledge base aims to obtain new data from the existing data in the knowledge base. But still, at some point, this data will stop um, because all the new data to be obtained will have already been obtained. This motivated uh, using incremental learning in order to add uh, a more dynamic a data addition to our knowledge base and to our model. And this summarizes our two problem statements for our approach, which is generating the knowledge graph in an end-to-end -end manner from um, question answering data set and to apply incremental learning in order to uh, keep on adding new knowledge whenever we uh, find the need to it. Okay, now we're going to move on to the background and some of the related work. We're going to start by discussing the construction of knowledge graph in general. 
A knowledge graph is a set of facts where a fact consists of three things. Two entities, head and tail, connected to each other through relation R, where the head and tail must belong to the set of all possible entities and the relation R belongs to the set of all possible relations. A lot of approaches have been uh, proposed to automate this process since it's usually done by experts, which is very expensive. So OpenIA is Open Information Extraction, which is an unsupervised annotator that extracts uh, the relation, uh, relational facts uh, from a given sentence by dividing this sentence into clauses. And these clauses are then uh, used to generate uh, fragments, which is shorter sentences that makes it easier to extract the subject verb object relations. So for example, for this text, which, which was extracted from one of the articles, uh, the U.S. President Barack Obama gave his speech on Tuesday and Wednesday to thousands of people. So from this sentence, we get to extract these five facts where Barack Obama is the head or the subject, and we have this relation connecting to each of the tales uh, in, this, uh, in this example. Another approach that was uh, proposed, uh, motivated by the power of uh, language models, is um, interpre interpreting uh, uh, knowledge graph extraction with uh, language models. The whole idea was motivated by the language model's ability to learn linguistic knowledge uh, during training and uh, to gain relational um, uh, knowledge between the data in the training set. Uh, well, also one of the main advantage that motivated uh, the many approaches to use language model knowledge to um, language models, I'm sorry, to extract the knowledge graph is their ability to extend to more data and they don't require a specific format or human annotation. So this, um, this overview or architecture uh, was used to uh, extract the knowledge graph in the following pipeline, motivated by the idea that language models are able to fill in the blank, uh, to solve fill in the blank clauses uh, by using their masking mechanism. We would generate the sentences, and from these sentences, we pass it to the language model to predict the missing uh, mask, and then use this mask to pass it to uh, a spacey, uh, texty uh, library model hybrid to then extract the uh, relational uh, triplets. This was not the only approach that was motivated by the power of language models. Another approach was uh, BERTNET that was uh, that uses the same approach while adding a paraphrasing uh, step in the middle before the generation of the language models, uh, uh, sorry, the, before the generation of the knowledge graph. Uh, the paraphrasing step uh, might be very time consuming and increases the search space, search space which is why they proposed uh, having a scoring uh, function that would uh, balance between the accuracy and the extracted uh, knowledge graph um, for uh, this approach. Now that we discussed the knowledge graph construction, the next part is to discuss uh, how to retrieve information from a knowledge graph, which is usually known as the link prediction task. A link prediction task is uh, usually divided into two categories, either it's a head prediction or a tail prediction. For the head prediction, we're looking for the head and we have information about the relation and the tail. While the tail prediction uh, is where the head is known and the relation is known, but the tail is missing. So this is the entity that we need to retrieve. Simply how this is done in most uh, knowledge graph uh, models is that we have a scoring function that would, that would evaluate all the possible um, entities for this fact and output the entity that is most probably correct for this given uh, element. Uh, obviously, the kind of knowledge uh, graph embedding would affect the scoring function and how, and how it works. In a comparative study done in uh, 2021, they categorized uh, most of the um, knowledge graph embedding models used into these three categories. The first one is the matrix factorization or the tensor decomposition models, where the task of uh, link prediction is considered a task, uh, tensor decomposition task as these models uh, process the knowledge graph as a 3D adjacency matrix or a straightway tensor uh, that is only partially observable due to the incompleteness problem that we discussed earlier. Uh, this tensor is then decomposed into low dimension vectors that are used as the embeddings for the relations and entities. And the second category is geometric models where the entities and relations are uh, viewed as a geometric transformation in Latin space and the fact uh, the scoring um, function 
is represented as the distance between uh, two entities and the relation between them. And the last uh, category is the, using deep learning models. Deep learning models uses neural network players to extract the features from the input by fine tuning the weights uh, of the neurons uh, in order to learn the embeddings of the knowledge graph. Now, moving on to uh, the last uh, point in our uh, background section, which is the incremental learning. Incremental learning in general aims to keep the system updated and allows a dynamic learning to add new knowledge whenever it's needed to our model. This approach and concept has been used in many domains and fields uh, to uh, allow the system to be updated as much as we can. Uh, one of the two main approaches that actually inspired our work today is uh, this um, IDS system, which, uh, which, is, which mainly consists of three modules. The first one is a dialogue embedding module that would take the user's utterance and extract the needed information for it, and then uh, evaluate the system's response using an uncertainty estimation module. This module evaluates how relevant this system responds to the user's question, and if it's not relevant enough, we ask a human in the loop to interfere and respond to this question. And then add this response added to our knowledge base and update the machine with it through an online learning module. Another module, uh, another approach was also um, inspired by the same idea, but instead of having an uncertainty estimation module, we'd have a reinforcement learning module. So they had a three elements, um, a, neural net a neural network model, uh, for task-oriented dialogue system that is already pre-trained and a classifier using reinforcement learning and a human in the loop. The idea was to have um, the classifier pick between the human and the model each time to uh, pick which one should respond to the user. Whenever the classifier picks the model and the model answers correctly, it's rewarded with high reward. Whenever the model answers incorrectly, it's uh, punished uh, heavily. Whenever the classifier picks the human in the loop, it's only rewarded with a small reward. And obviously the human in the loop also updates the model so that we get to maximize the uh, task success and minimize the need for the human uh, throughout the, the deployment phase. Uh, now moving on to our methodology. Uh, this is an overview of how the, our approach work. Uh, we mainly focus on two phases. The first phase is the training phase where uh, we get to extract the knowledge graph from a question answering data set and then use this extracted knowledge graph to uh, feed it to a knowledge graph embedding model that would learn the features of uh, the, the extracted facts. And in the deployment uh, phase, we have the incremental learning module that would uh, ask a human in the loop to interfere and ask answer a certain question in case the model is not able to answer it correctly, and then feed the result from the human in the loop to the knowledge graph and to the embedding model in order to keep on learning new knowledge. Okay, so our first uh, module is the knowledge graph construction module, which takes a question answering data set and uh, the end goal is to generate a knowledge graph from it. So we take the question and we generate a parse tree for the given question. A parse tree would look something like this, which is the grammatical representation of a given question. And from this grammatical representation, we loop over the notes to rearrange the sentence, to rearrange the question into a sentence format, while having a space uh, specified for the answer position. And we take the answer from this question answer pair and place it in the correct position in this sentence. Now that we have a sentence, we get to pass it to OpenIE, which is open information extraction that we already discussed in the background to generate the facts from a given sentences. And we keep on doing that uh, with uh, all the question answers pairs. The good thing about OpenIE is that uh, the facts generated are human readable, which makes it easier in the generation process to uh, generate the answer into natural language text. Now that we have uh, our uh, knowledge graph ready, we move on to the uh, knowledge graph embedding model. In this experiment, we actually picked uh, trans E, which is a geometric model for, as our knowledge graph embedding model. Uh, trans E is um, defined by the size of the entities with a hyperparameter uh, K as the dimension and the size of the relations with a hyperparameter K. So basically, for each entity, we have a dimension 
which is randomly initialized at the beginning, and so is the relations. And these uh, embeddings are um, fine-tuned by minimizing this loss function. This long loss functions aim to teach the model the difference between a correct and uh, a correct fact and a corrupted fact. Where s dash is the set of corrupted facts, where we take a, a real fact from the um, data set and we change either the head or the tail, not both at the same time, with a random uh, entity. And then we teach the model to learn the difference that this is a corrupted fact, so we need to uh, reduce the result for it. And this is the correct fact that we need to actually learn this is good for us. Since trans E is an energy based module, it um, considers the tail value as a vector um, to be correct whenever its summation is uh, equal, uh, whenever its value is equal to the summation between the head and the relation uh, vectors in the uh, in the Latin space. Trans E, um, because of this, trans E is not good at predicting one to n or n to n or n to one um, relations, which is one of its limitations. And we're going to discuss how we can overcome that in our last module, which is the selection module. Okay, so moving on to our uh, third module, which is the incremental learning module. First of all, before discussing how it works, we need to understand how we extract the information from the user since we have a knowledge graph. In our approach, we propose to use the same uh, concept that we, knew, that we used to uh, construct the knowledge graph at the, same, uh, at the first place. So we have the user sending their question, we generate the parse tree for a given question, and then we make the sentence format out of it. The reason why we do that is that we need to extract the facts that already exist in the question as context for us to know which, in which direction to navigate this question. Um, after that, we get to highlight which uh, link prediction is needed, which fact is the missing fact, and then send this fact to the knowledge uh, graph embedding model that would extract the uh, missing uh, entity for us. In case this uh, prediction that the model made was not correct, we ask a human in the loop to interfere and to update the model and the knowledge graph with the correct answer. Updating the model with the correct answer is not that simple because uh, what if the new fact that is fed to the model contains an entity that does not belong to our set of entities? As we discussed before, trans E is defined by the set of entities that specifies each entity in this um, knowledge graph. So if we have something outside of this, this would cause an error, which motivated the use of uh, adding a new dimension for the model. So basically how it works, whenever we have a new entity, a new fact that we need to feed it to the model, the first thing that we check is whether one of these entities or both of them belongs to, uh, does not belong to the set of entities predefined or not. So if this is the case, we add it to our set of entities, and we add an embedding for it, which is obviously randomly initialized at the beginning. And then we add this new embedding to uh, the set of embeddings for the model to, to uh, allow the model to retrain on it as if this was one of the um, entities at the beginning. And we do the same for the second entity in case this entity also does not belong to our set of entities. Once we have the embeddings ready, for uh, the model and we have enough dimension for them, we train the model on this new fact. But to avoid overfitting, we use the same concept as uh, the training uh, concept by adding corrupted values to uh, allow the model to learn the difference between uh, training uh, on a correct one and incorrect values. Now for our last module, which is the selection module, the objective of it was to reduce the gap between um, the trans E not being able to answer one to n um, relations in the knowledge graph. So, for example, a question like this, we get to extract these three facts. The first fact and the second fact are complete, but the third fact is the one that we need to predict an entity for. And in our knowledge graph, we know that we have these three facts available. So instead of letting the model just predict the first one and not knowing that this is this is already exists in our uh, question, so we allow the model to predict more than a correct answer. And since we know that the first two appeared in the question, we get to know that the last one is actually the correct one for uh, that the user is looking for. So this is basically how the selection module works. 
the selection module will take a question queue and uh, get its trend, uh, its parse tree, and then transform it into a sentence and get the facts uh, out of it. When predicting, uh, when allowing the model to predict the missing fact, instead of just retrieving the most uh, probably uh, correct fact, we ask it to predict the top k facts and uh, eliminate those facts that already appeared in the question as our context so that we don't uh, repeat something that the user already know. So uh, now moving on to our experiments and results. Since our first contribution was to uh, construct the knowledge graph in an end-to-end -end manner, uh, we decided to evaluate using OpenIE versus using a language model on a question answering data set. For our experiments, we used a squad data set, which is a collection of um, crowdsourced um, question answers along with their um, articles from Wikipedia. This allows the data set to be very diverse, which makes it uh, perfect for our scenario. So from the squad data set, this table shows the result for uh, 57,000 uh, sentences and question answering tags. Um, the language model approach from the related work actually took three hours to process 10,000 um, sentences, which, which we can see that there is a huge different, uh, time difference between the two approaches. OpenIE took two hours, uh, almost two hours to process the whole uh, 57,000, while the language model took three hours to process um, 10,000 uh, question answering pairs or sentences uh, output of that. And we can see also that the count of facts, relations, and entities uh, are very different between the two approaches. The reason is that OpenIE generates the facts human readable, which might make the facts generated uh, a bit redundant. And two facts could have semantically the same meaning, but we don't count for that since we take both of them into the knowledge base, which is why the count of entities is huge in this scenario. But this could be fixed by uh, text uh, normalization. Uh, it's basically a designer choice whether or not we want it to be uh, more uh, semantically uh, equivalent or we need to have everything even if it's duplicates. We moved on with the open IE uh, approach since it saves us a lot of time rather than using the language model approach. Uh, for the incremental learning results, we evaluated on the squad data set and the knowledge graph that we generated uh, from this data set by not taking only uh, 57,000 question answer pairs, but also taking uh, 70,000 uh, question answering pairs. From these 70,000 question answering pay, uh, pairs, uh, we generated uh, 71 facts along with their entities and relations. Also, we used uh, this data set as well, which uh, consists of uh, um, also almost a million facts with 37 relations and uh, 123,000 uh, um, entities uh, in the knowledge graph. This data set uh, is actually uh, diverse as it describes uh, the human attributes. So each entity is actually uh, is connected to over 10 uh, relations to make them more diverse. Uh, these relations describe uh, human attributes like association, profession, gender, and so on. And uh, the third data set that we used is the Firebase uh, to, uh, 237 uh, updated version. Uh, this data set was uh, generated from Firebase uh, mentions. Um, for those mentions who has more than uh, 100, uh, count for them. Also featuring wiki links database uh, to support these uh, features. This data set contains uh, 15, uh, uh, sorry, contains 154,000 facts uh, along with 237 relations and 14,000 uh, entities. Okay, so our evaluation matrix matrices for this module was uh, the mean range, which is the average obtained uh, rank, uh, average obtained ranks, uh, it ranges between one and the length of the entities. As the value gets closer to one, it means that the performance is actually improving, but this matrix is known to be sensitive to outliers, which is why it's usually not used alone. The MRR is uh, ranges between zero and one, and it's the average of the inverse obtained uh, ranks of these ranks. And the higher the value gets, the better the model performs. 
And the last metric is the hits at K, uh, which is the ratio prediction for which the ranks is uh, equal or less than the threshold K, meaning whenever we get to reach the answer uh, before uh, this threshold uh, gets. It ranges between zero and one, and um, the closer it gets to one, the better. Common values used for the K is one, three, five, and 10. The higher the value gets, uh, the better uh, for our approach. And uh, we mainly focus on a value of K equal to 10. And this is how we evaluate our uh, approach in general. This is what we're going to refer to as the overall performance um, on the data sets. For each of the three data sets, we saved 50 entities along with their facts to be unseen for the models, to save them for the incremental learning experiments. Each of those uh, data sets we uh, evaluated on four scenarios. The first scenario is to train the model and to test it on the test set already available in, uh, in, the, in the data set. And then you uh, save the mispredicted facts from this test, test set to uh, apply incremental learning and see if this uh, improves the performance of the model further on or not. And the third scenario is where we train the model on the unseen entities and unseen facts by adding the new uh, parameter and dimension for the model and evaluate whether or not the model is able to uh, view these uh, entities um, next time it's asked to predict them. And the last uh, scenario is where we um, evaluate the overall performance and see if any of this incremental learning would affect the previous knowledge known before. So starting with our first data set, uh, for the first scenario, when we trained it, uh, uh, when training on uh, the training data set and testing on the test set uh, available without the unseen values, uh, the model's performance was 56%, saving the mispredicted values, it reached um, uh, uh, 98%. And then when we train this model on unseen facts, uh, the model was able to predict these unseen facts the next time uh, by accuracy of 92% and uh, to see if uh, adding these uh, unseen facts would affect the model's performance. We uh, tested on all the tests that including the unseen facts and the model was able to correctly predict them with 94% accuracy. Now for our second data set, which is the Firebase da uh, data set, uh, for the training and testing, the model uh, performance was 46%. And when saving and applying incremental learning on the mispredicted facts, uh, the model reached accuracy of 62%. And when uh, applying incremental learning on unseen facts, uh, the model was able to correctly predict 83% uh, of the unseen facts the next time we're asking for it. And when evaluating on the unseen facts and the test files that we have, uh, the model's overall performance was 57%. The drop from 62 to 57 is actually acceptable in our scenario for one reason. Before, the model was not able to um, learn or know or answer entities that is not already available in the data set. So adding, an, adding a new dimension might affect slightly the uh, accuracy as we can see here, but uh, this could be fixed by further incremental learning. Now for our generated data set from the squad, um, we get to see that the training and testing on the accuracy performed very poorly, that it's almost 2% accuracy. The reason for such poor performance uh, on the testing set is that we generated the squad data set in an end-to-end -end manner from questions and answers. Taking 50 entities on the side uh, creates a gap in this knowledge graph that we created. Also taking uh, some of the data set in the test file makes this gap, gap larger as we saved 30% uh, uh, for the uh, test file. So this is a very good chance to test if incremental learning actually reduces this gap. Uh, by saving the mispredicted facts from the test set and applying incremental learning on it, we can see that the model is now able to correctly predict 91% of these test, uh, these test facts. And uh, when trained on the unseen facts and entities, the model was able to predict them with accuracy of uh, 98%. And to test if this 98% will cause any overfitting, we can see that uh, in the last scenario, the model was able to correctly predict 
um, the previous uh, facts were not affected uh, with a accuracy of 91%. Now, moving on to our conclusion and uh, some of the future work that we propose. We started this presentation by explaining uh, the difference between um, the techniques used for the knowledge representation and, and how this affects the retrieval process. Uh, this was our first problem statement to uh, generate the knowledge graph from question answering um, pairs, data sets as they are more available, and we believe that this opens up a new area for um, research and to investigate this problem further on. Uh, constructing a knowledge base in general is a very um, expensive process, so this might save uh, a lot of time, and automating this might uh, result into better results since question answering pairs, data sets are unstructured, while a knowledge graph uh, are more structured uh, knowledge representation. Uh, and then we talked about the need of incremental learning uh, for uh, most of the data sets, especially knowledge graphs, so that we can get to add new knowledge whenever uh, it appears uh, like the system needs to learn more. Um, especially generating the model in uh, generating the knowledge graph in an end to end manner, we cannot guarantee that the, mod, that the graph contains all the information needed for the system. So this supports our uh, incremental learning idea. Uh, we evaluated our approach on uh, three data set, uh, three of which uh, shown uh, promising results. And now moving on to the future work. Uh, the good thing about our framework is that it's robust and flexible that we get to replace the techniques used in each module and see different results and evaluate different uh, options depending on the type of knowledge that we want to represent. So in the future, we aim to explore different uh, approaches to uh, generate the knowledge graph in an end-to-end -end manner also from question answering data sets. We also aim to explore different uh, embedding modules uh, for the knowledge graph. And for the link prediction, we believe that uh, we are currently working on and we believe that uh, adding an uh, a reinforcement learning agent to retrieve the answer will uh, perform better and will be more uh, uh, more suitable for the incremental learning uh, approach. Um, reinforcement learning agents in general learn by trial and error and interactive environments. So having this um, having this um, interactive environment with the incremental learning uh, would perform into good results, as we believe. Um, uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, this is all for me. Uh, if you have any questions, I will be more than happy to answer them.